Texas is heading to Fort Worth on Saturday to play an underperforming TCU team. Why does their offense struggle to finish? How is their defense taking a step back? And what can Texas do to not have TCU spoil our championship aspirations? After the show, Inside Texas is the best place to follow your favorite team week in and week out. Intelligent pre and post game analysis, up to the minute recruiting updates, and behind the scenes team info is dropping on the daily. Subscribe to InsideTexas.com today. Link in the description. TCU doesn't have much to fight for besides their pride and would love nothing more than to give Texas a black eye on our way out of the conference. But can they pull it off? Without further ado, let's get into it. After a remarkable season in 2022, TCU predictably fell from the mountaintop. They lost too much. Their quarterback, the three most productive receivers, the two most productive running backs, an All-American guard Steve Avila, and All-Big 12 center Alan Ali all departed to the NFL. Coming into the season, the Horn Frogs were the 130th ranked offense in returning production. On top of that, their offensive coordinator Garrett Riley gets poached by Clemson. Sonny Dykes brought in Arkansas's Kendall Bryles, known for his evolution of his dad Art Bryles' famous Baylor offense. An 11 personnel wide receiver focused scheme utilizing crazy tempo, running the fifth most plays in the country, averaging 80 plays per game. Bryles tries to be more run balanced than his father, but TCU has been playing from behind a lot, forcing them to become overly pass dependent with the six most pass attempts in the country. The overall numbers of the TCU offense are pretty good. Their Achilles heel is executing when it counts, ranking 126 of 131 teams in red zone scoring. And if you can't score up close, then you at least have to be explosive, able to score from distance, but they lack there as well. Losing Max Duggan was more than just losing a quarterback. You lost the tough mentality that permeated and propelled the offense last season. For the second year in a row, TCU started sophomore Chandler Morris. He went down in the Iowa State game, re-injuring the knee that took him out last year. He did all right, 66 in completion percentage, good for fourth in the league, 7.6 yards per attempt, right at league average at ninth, with a slightly below average 9-yard average depth of target. But the missing context is his three wins came against FCS Nichols, Houston, and SMU. TCU hasn't beaten a traditional Power 5 opponent this entire season. He's shifty and he can make some nice runs and extend plays, so he can threaten defenses, but it doesn't outweigh the bat. In his time starting, he made 7 NFL caliber big time throws while making 11 turnover worthy plays. Statistically below average on the deep ball, slightly above average on the intermediate ball, and very accurate short. Morris can get hot and look like a world beater with some flashy plays, but there's this uneasiness, nervousness to his game that always stands out to me. Even though he's technically a sophomore, it is his fourth year in college, and I expected to see better decision making throwing five picks in five and a half games of playtime. Overall, he's the seventh graded quarterback in the league, but once again, that wasn't against the meat of the Big 12 schedule. He's injury prone, but he did suit up versus Texas Tech even though he didn't play. As of writing this video, we don't know if he's coming back for the Texas game or not. In his absence, the redshirt freshman Josh Hoover stepped in. The lack of experience has been on display. What I like is he isn't timid. He lets that thing fly. He's a gunslinger. The problem is that he's just as likely to shoot himself in the foot as he is to hit his target, throwing seven interceptions to his seven touchdowns. When he's on the field, I'm looking for slants and seams, due to the Bryles offense naturally, but also because he's not ready for anything too advanced. He locks onto pre-snap reads and rifles it in there regardless if there's three dudes there waiting to intercept it. On the flip side, he makes some impressive throws because he does lack that hesitancy and he can hurt you when he is on point. Hoover has a good arm able to generate the velocity, he's just inaccurate due to rush mechanics, leading to him being 12th in completion percentage, completing 60% of his passes for 12th of 19 Big 12 quarterbacks. It's dinging his yards per pass attempt as well, averaging 6.6 .6 yards per pass, 15th of 17 quarterbacks. Regardless of the struggles early, I think he'll actually turn into a good quarterback. If he can add discipline to his arm and his confidence, he'll be able to make some noise in the coming seasons. But for right now, he's the 10th graded passer out of 17 Big 12 QBs. 
Even though TCU runs the sixth most passing plays in the nation and has the 18th most passing yards per game, they're just brute forcing the passing stats with volume. They're 82nd in yards per pass and 82nd in passing explosivity, with Browse preferring to hit the quick stuff to stay on schedule. Similar to the OU style of play, they're all veer and shoot offenses. After losing almost all of their receiving production, TCU brought in some talent from the portal to try to keep the pass game functioning at a high level. The best move they made was bringing in Oklahoma State transfer slot receiver J.P. Richardson. The six foot, 190 190-pound junior leads the team in targets with 54, and he's perfect for the Bryle system of quick hitters over the middle. There's nothing that makes him elite. He's quick enough, a decent size, pretty good hands, and he gets to his spot. The key is he does everything at a good level and can be relied upon to move the offense forward. His ability is more appreciated in his full body of work than any individual play. He'll get you a few times per game and move the sticks. This well-roundedness has him as the first graded receiver in the entire Big 12. Second in targets is the giant 6'5", 225-pound returning junior, Savion Williams. He was a good fourth option last season, able to grab some balls when the heat was on Johnston, Barber, or Davis. But with those three guys gone, he's had to step up into more of a central role. Of course, with that size, he's a threat to Masu deep or in the red zone, but Bryles passes to him on all levels. He's not going to burn you as a possession receiver, ranking 41st of 51 receivers in yards after catch per reception, but be aware of him boxing you out and plucking the ball from above. Overall, he's the 22nd ranked wide receiver out of 51 in the league. Third in targets is a former Texas transfer, the 6'7", 260-pound senior Jared Wiley with 41. He's most effective in the short game and in the red zone, able to capitalize on smaller linebackers and safeties. And once they catch you sleeping, they'll slip him up the middle for a big game. Overall, he's the seventh of 15 receiving tight ends in the conference. The 5'9", 180-pound Ole Miss transfer Jalen Robinson is fourth in targets with 36, catching 24 of those. He was able to start last week due to another receiver going down. Robinson has good speed and he can challenge you vertically, getting off the line quickly. But overall, he's the 43rd graded receiver of 51. The receiver that went down with injury versus Tech was starting outside receiver Dalen Wright with 27 targets. As of writing this video, I don't know the diagnosis. He offers traditional outside receiver size at 6'3", 210 pounds. The Minnesota transfer is your best downfield threat due to that size and speed combination. The quarterbacks are shaky deep, so he does have a poor 41% catch rate. But watching him back at Minnesota, he can frame the ball well and pull it down in better conditions. But due to the lack of receptions, he's the 42nd of 51 receivers in the league. And there's several more guys that get a low amount of reps outside the starting rotation, but we don't have all day. They do have more speed in the slot to bring out like Major Everhart or JoJo Earl, more outside size with a guy like Warren Thompson, and two big tight ends that can make catches in the 6'5", Chase Curtis, or the 6'4", DeAndre Rogers. But the reason so many guys get targets is because the receivers are struggling to get in rhythm with shaky quarterbacks. You'll see a lot of confusion and misplaced throws. In a perfect world, the TCU offense likes to get the ball out pretty quickly, but due to being behind in games, they've had to lean more towards longer developing concepts recently. The offensive line isn't holding up, making the quarterback's job even harder. TCU only has two top half pass blocking offensive linemen with right guard Willis Patrick at 10th and right tackle Andrew Coker at 26th. The remaining linemen are all bottom half of 81 pass blockers. The unit as a whole has given up the second most pressures in the league with 79 and the third most hurries. The quarterbacks will rush throws under pressure, so the offensive line has only given up four sacks, which has saved their overall pass blocking efficiency, putting them at 9th in the league. Under normal circumstances, Bryles likes to have a healthy run-pass split, but they've had to abandon it at times even though it's been pretty effective. 43rd in yards per rush and 22nd in success rate able to get positive yards consistently. They just lack the home run balls as the 104th most explosive rushing offense. Last year, TCU had two really quality backs that went pro. This year, the 5'9", 207-pound Amani Bailey has had to step up and he's done well. 6th in yards after contact per attempt, 10th in breakaway percentage, and 9th in yards per attempt at 5.5. Due to that consistency, he's the 7th graded back of 28 Big 12 rushers. 
If they want to try to punch it in on the goal line, they'll bring in the heavier Alabama transfer, Trey Sanders. But he's near the bottom of the league in every category, so they just prefer the physics of his 222-pound body. But he's super inefficient in the open field, graded 22nd of 28 running backs in the league. Luckily, the offensive line does perform better in the run than the pass. They're 18th in the country for offensive line yards and 17th in power success rate, able to get a push on short downs and distances. Right guard Willis Patrick is 9th, center John Lance is 20th, and left tackle Brandon Coleman is 26th. In a closer game, this might be more of a factor, but if you get up by a good amount, their run blocking strength is less utilized. This TCU offense does a good job moving the ball between the 20s. Overall, above average in points per game, yards per play, points per drive, offensive success rate, their fatal flaw is just not finishing the job. Rather, that's throwing an interception in crunch time or a consistent inability to score in the red zone. But if they play clean and have one of their better games, they can challenge opposing teams. The keys for the Texas defense are interesting. First, TCU is a solid rushing offense, ranked 29th in yards per rush. But Texas is a superior rushing defense, only allowing 3.2 yards per game with the best interior defensive line duo in the nation with Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy ranking first and third for all of Power 5. What's interesting is our strength ends up forcing teams to target our weakness. Texas isn't good on the back foot in the pass game against the two-minute drill. We can give up easy underneath routes naturally, and in the crunch, Texas also tends to give up the intermediate ball when receivers sit down in the zone. Philosophically, TCU has one of the fastest tempos in the nation with an emphasis on the quick game. Under normal circumstances, Texas defends the pass really well, 33rd in the nation in defensive yards per pass. But in those specific moments where teams are selling out to pass and they're doing it quickly, it seems to overwhelm our defensive system. TCU's offense's natural design matches the Texas defensive weakness, and if for whatever reason TCU wakes up and decides to maximize their potential, it could be an issue. But the trump card is that TCU is one of the worst red zone offenses in the nation at 126th, while the Texas defense is elite in the red zone ranked 6th in the country, and that should ultimately be the mismatch of the game. The TCU offense is weird this year because they should be far better than their record if it weren't for this lack of team cohesion leading them to break down when it counts, while also ranking 90th in the country in penalties limiting their success even further. But the group we expected to improve this year was actually the defense, and there's been issues on that side of the ball. But before we hit the defense, the sponsor of today's video is Prize Picks. Prize Picks is a skill based daily fantasy sports app where you can make college football player projections all season long. How does it work? You select two to six players and choose more or less on their prize pick projections. It could be passing yards, rushing yards, receiving yards, and more. And if those players score more or less than their prize pick projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. Just hop on the Prize Picks app or website, go to the College Football tab, and check out the player projections. It's a smooth process where you can make your entries in 60 seconds or less with fast withdrawals. It's that easy. As a first time depositor, use promo code TexasHomer and you will receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. That's double your money up to $100 for your first time. So sign up for prize picks, use promo code TexasHomer at sign up, and add even more excitement to your game day. Link in the description. The defense didn't get obliterated by the draft like the offensive side of the ball, returning 71% of their squad for a healthy 40th in the nation. So it was expected there would be a natural year two bump, but we haven't seen that yet. In the run game, they play super aggressive, crashing the line with multiple bodies as soon as they get their run keys. The upside is they can make contact at the line of scrimmage often with their speed, but if they don't fit their assignments, backs can get loose and gash them. This also leaves them open to well-carried-out run fakes because they are so stop-the-run focused. They've done an average job, giving up 4.1 yards per rush, good for 62nd in the country. The problem is their last three games, they have been performing much worse, putting them at 88th in the nation. In a 3-3-5 personnel grouping, you're getting rid of size on the line so your faster, more athletic bodies can make tackles. 
but TCU is whiffing on those far too often and allowing running backs to get extra yards. On the interior, only starting nose Dominic Williams is performing well, ranked 10th of 50 interior run stoppers. Depth guys like Tymon Mitchell and Sony Misi are ranked in the bottom 10. But they have started experimenting putting their traditional nose guys on the edge to increase their overall size. On the exterior, edge Caleb Fox is a top third run stopper at 15th, but that's it on high performers on the line against the run. TCU has a super versatile athlete at their Sam spot in Namdi Obi Izor, and he's the fourth graded run stopping linebacker in the league. But unfortunately, Mike Jomoy Hodge and Will Johnny Hodges are below average at 27th and 28th of 49. So you have one linebacker that's consistently stopping the run, but where it breaks down further is the lack of secondary guys making plays. Their best DB run stopper isn't a starter in rotational safety, Abe Kamara, ranked 10th, with only two starters barely cracking the top half, with free safety Millard Bradford ranking 46th and starting corner Josh Newton at 48th of 104 run-stopping DBs. The TCU defense has athletes, they just look disjointed as a squad. Holistically, the pass rush does decent, averaging 2.4 sacks per game, ranking 48th. They can utilize different looks to generate pressures like walking a linebacker down as a fourth rusher or firing a second level player from depth as that fifth rusher. Dominic Williams is their best interior pass rusher, ranked 20th of 47 guys with 13 pressures, two of which are sacks, but the rest aren't producing at a high level. Both traditional starters on the edge are struggling to impact the game consistently with Paul Oyewale ranking 39th and Caleb Fox ranking 51st of 54 exterior pass rushers. Namdi Obiizor shows up once again as being the best pass rusher of the group at Sam Linebacker with 23 total pressures and 4 sacks, ranked 5th of 30 pass rushing linebackers. Mike Jamoy Hodge has 22 pressures and 3 sacks and he is sent the most often. The only issue is he wins on just 2.8% of those rushes, so he's ranked 19th of 30 guys. And the secondary isn't sent often enough to qualify. The pass coverage is also performing poorly, giving up 7.4 yards per completion, ranking 70th in the nation, with the 86th ranked defensive passing explosivity, so you can take advantage of those one-on-ones when they do go into man. Weak side linebacker Johnny Hodges is the best coverage defender at 8th, which is always amusing because players that use a neck roll should be disqualified from dropping back in coverage, period. And once again, that well-rounded Sam linebacker, Namdi Obi-Izor, is ranked 12th of 48 backers in coverage. One secondary player that is dominant in coverage is corner Josh Newton, early rounder only giving up 46% of his targets and forcing incompletions at a high 22% of the time. And he's the third best coverage DB in the conference. Rotational safety Abe Kamara ranks 14th and he snatched two interceptions, with free safety Millard Bradford ranking 45th. So two starters make the top half, but the rest are playing at a subpar level. It's a far cry from Patterson's DB-centric system. The TCU defense overall is 37th in the advanced metric DFEI. They can cause issues and they do have some dudes, but like the offense, they fail at key moments or incur silly penalties. They have personnel, they have winning coaches, they have proven schemes. They're just missing a togetherness and the ability to band together when it gets rocky. The opposite mentality of last year's TCU team. They just have to get out of their own way first. And maybe playing Texas gives them that clear purpose this week. The keys for the Texas offense are entirely dependent on if Quinn can make a return, which isn't known at the time of writing this video. On paper, Texas has the advantage in the run and the pass, but that doesn't mean much if we turn it over several times again. Sark is going to have to be hyper aware of Malik's lack of experience and how throwing an interception can cause him to chase bad ball after bad ball. Keep those deep shots in rotation to stop the defense from crowding the run, but be very wary of the intermediate throws where TCU's DBs can disguise coverage and make breaks on the ball. Late throws, short or intermediate, give opportunities for pick sixes. Once again, style points don't mean anything if Quinn is out, so do whatever you gotta do, especially on the road. 
For the Horn Frogs, they won a ton of their nail biters last year and they regress back towards the mean and they can look really bad at times. But ultimately, they aren't as sketchy as their record implies. Especially when both TCU and Texas are unsure of their starters at quarterback at this point in the week. So all we can do is hop on this roller coaster together and see how it goes when the Longhorns head to Fort Worth this Saturday night. Thanks for hanging out. Watch some more of my videos here. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support Quality Texas content. As always, hook on.